Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the day two of the Business Redefined Summit. We had a powerful, power-packed day yesterday, and trust me, day two is even going to be better. Our vision is a clear picture of what success will be at a particular time in the future. With the future uncertain, the vision is becoming hazy. Business owners need to rethink around creating a powerful vision and putting that vision into action in their company. It helps us clarify their own thinking, align their teams in a common direction with a shared purpose, and initiate action to achieve your business goals. To start the day, we have an inspiring and invaluable human being, Mr. Brad Sugars, chairman and founder, Action Coach. He has taken business re-education to new, more innovative and exciting levels and needs no introduction. We are so glad and excited to have him today with us. Trust me, this is going to be your exclusive to something special. Presenting before you, Brad Sugars. A self-made multimillionaire, CEO and founder of the global business coaching franchise Action Coach, a best-selling author, and an international business speaker, please join us in welcoming Brad Sugars. Hi, good morning. Uh, it's good evening from here in Las Vegas and uh, looking forward to chatting to everybody and making certain that we get a valuable use of our hour together here today. Uh, I understand uh, from a few of the snippets of yesterday that was some amazing learnings and we're going to continue that today. So uh, I hope you have a pen and paper ready because we're going to be taking a lot of notes because we're going to be teaching pretty dang fast today. I want to teach on two subjects today. One is the uh, prescribed subject of vision uh, and definitely looking at that because in this timing, uh, there's many things. I want to just take a few minutes at the start of this to talk about the timing and uh, the effects of the economic uh, crisis because of the health crisis. And when we sit down and we take a look at it, every seven to 10 years, the world goes through or every market goes through a negative cycle of the economy. You never know what's going to bring it about. We can go back and talk about the uh, internet bubble. We can talk about the real estate bubble. We can talk about many different historical. This is my fourth economic downturn that I'm going through as a business person and business owner. And uh, it's, I, I feel comforted in this one because, uh, A, we know that the economic downturn is here. In most economic downturns like 2008, people took a year to a year and a half to actually decide it was a downturn. Uh, and then they took a year to actually react to that. And then it was another year, a year and a half to get through the winter of the economic winter. If I use that terminology of summer being the boom, then fall and then the winter. Well, we sit here today knowing that we are in an economic fall. It'll be different in different markets around the world. Obviously, uh, some markets will be very hard hit, the Italians, the Spanish, uh, certain segments of the United States will be fairly hard hit. Other markets will be less hard hit. And uh, these are the things that we know. What we also know is that governments around the world are taking massive action in certain markets. Obviously, those with the biggest impact are taking the biggest uh, steps. Here in the United States, uh, it is already at two trillion, uh, probably going to go to six trillion in economic impact, which is basically GDP. Um, in Australia, uh, uh, very, very high levels, New Zealand, very high levels, the UK, very high levels. In India, of course, uh, we're watching and waiting to see where everything falls out. But uh, the economic crisis of this is, a, is of a global nature. It's not just one country. And therefore, um, I believe that the level of uh, input from governments will be very important. That being said, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the economic crisis on today's webinar. If you want to see, I've done two webinars in the last few weeks on the economic crisis. You can jump on my YouTube channel and see uh, the crisis averted. There's two webinars there of an hour long each of what to do to get through an economic pandemic. What I want to look at today is flipping it over. There is survive mode when the economic crisis happens and then there's thrive mode. Once you've, once you've worked out Survive, which was those other two webinars that I have online, you can watch them anytime you want, or you can chat to any action coach, they can actually take you through that material as well. Once you get through the Survive mode, it then turns and says, okay, what am I going to do to come out of this thing stronger? And so to that end, I want to teach two things today. 
One is, what does it look like to put together a, a, a multiplication style business, a business that is growing at the level of exponential growth? And the second is, what level of vision do we need right now as business leaders? And so I'm going to start with what takes the exponential growth to us. And I'm going to start sharing my screen for that um, uh, so that uh, we can make sure we do that. If uh, one of the team can actually make it that I can share my screen, make me a, 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 sh a screen share, that would be fantastic, uh, just to give me permission to do that. In, in order for us to grow and, and to teach this, actually, where I'm going to be teaching from is uh, this is my latest book called Pulling Profits Out of a Hat. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, definitely jump on Amazon, Pulling Profits Out of a Hat, uh, bestseller here in the States, in uh, Australia, in the UK. And so what we're going to look at today is, is really stuff from that. Uh, and so make certain that you understand that this is going to be very, very simple. Uh, the way I teach is very simple. And the way I teach is really about what to do. And so today is going to be based on that. For those of you that don't know much of my background, I'm an entrepreneur. I, currently, I own nine companies that I'm running. Uh, we've pivoted eight of the nine companies to either be in survive mode or thrive mode, thus making money to get through this and paying all of their bills. Only one of our companies, which is a restaurant in the Wynn Casino here in Las Vegas, my hometown, uh, which we had to shut down purely because. So I want to take a look at the five disciplines of exponential growth in the first half of our session here today so that you can understand what it means to me to have serious growth in a business and to look at that level of serious growth. Um, and if we get time at the end of today, we will take some questions. I'm not sure I'll have time once I get through the teaching, but if I do, uh, I will definitely do that. So what is adding zeros mean? Zeros means instead of adding a, uh, a growth to your business, it means adding a zero to that bottom line. Instead of adding, you know, 10% growth, well, I put it this way. Instead of 30% growth, how do you go for 30 times growth? Now, the distinct difference in thinking is that if we look at a crisis like this, in, in any uh, crisis, there is massive opportunity. And in today's world, I see vast opportunity for those companies that want to take it. Many companies will shut down and hide and try and ride this out. The best companies will actually go into boom through this period. They'll get into a thrive mode and do phenomenally well. See, 30% thinking is how do I add one more customer? 30 times thinking is how do I add 100 new customers? 30% thinking is how do I add one new employee? 30 times thinking is how do I open a new office? 30% might be how do I open a new office? 30 times might be how do I open a whole new province, a new state uh, to, to trade in? 30% uh, 30, 30 might be how do I open a new state? 30 times might be how do I open a whole new country? From a whole new country, we go to a whole new continent. You know, it's that level of thinking that we want to see for every single person that is out there in the marketplace. And that's really what it is all about uh, when, I'm, when I'm sitting talking with people about their growth. You know, every time we look at this, we start sitting down thinking, instead of going for 30%, how do you go for 30 times? And most people think, oh, it's not possible for me to do that. Correct. Without understanding the five disciplines, it's not possible for you to do that. Once you understand the five disciplines, we get to that core. Now, where this comes in, here are the five core disciplines. Number one is strategy. And we'll discuss each of these in a little bit of detail as we go through today. Number two is mission, which we're gonna get into a fair bit of detail because we also wanna look at the vision of the company. Number three is execution. Number four being the people. And number five, the discipline of business development. Now I use the terminology discipline because none of these do you get them right and then you can just leave them. There is a discipline. You have to keep mastering it. You have to keep getting better at it. And that's the way this works time and time and time again. So let's examine each of these five core disciplines in a little bit of detail in the timing that we have to make certain that everybody understands what it is that I'm, I'm getting to. This is how we grow companies that add zeros. Now, to put this uh, book together, my co-author and I literally took two years to build this and study the work in our clients. So number one, let's start with mission. I use the word love and people are like, how can you use the word love in business? Well, very simply put, 
Do your customers love doing business with you? Not like it, not enjoy it, not think it's okay. Do they feel like they're on a mission when they're buying from you? Do they love buying from you? And second way to use it is, do your staff love coming to work? And you have to ask yourself that question, or if you chat with one of my Action Coach team, they can ask you these questions about how do you build a business where customers love buying from you and where staff love coming to work? The second part of mission is what are the core values of the company? Is the business run on its core values or is the business run based on the, only the profitability? See, once we understand the core values of a company, and in this day and age with the millennial generation, core values are more and more important than they've ever been. People buy from companies where they see the companies doing right, the right thing by the market, the right thing by the customers, the right thing by the community, and the right thing by uh, the economy and the earth. When we see a company that's doing the right things, they get great results. When we see a company who's flaunting these things, we don't see them as a growth company to the level that we're talking about. And adding zeros company, companies that are growing at that rate, have a core set of values and they operate based on that core set of values. Number three, they have more of a purpose than they do just a profit-driven business. A business that is purely about its bottom line profits today is not a company that going forward will be a thrive company. It's not an adding zeros company. They will not be growing exponentially. The core purpose of a business has to be greater than profitability. It has to be to add value, to do something, to change the way business is done, to change the world, to create something out there. And the fourth point of mission is that this company needs to be giving back. This company needs to be doing things that allows the market to say, wow, look at how they are giving back to their community. And it can be in simple things, it can be in large things. If we start understanding that these four parts of mission allow a company to do phenomenal things, then we start seeing real companies that are doing high level performance. Your mission is part of that. I will get to vision later on in our session here today. So then we look to execution. Execution is the delivery of the product or service on time, on budget consistency. Now where execution kicks in, again, let's take the core parts of execution. Number one is planning. And in this day and age, especially in a virtual world, as we're moving more and more virtual and we're being forced to move more and more virtual, in a virtual world, how you plan is a massive part of your success. Now I've always taught that the most important plan is the daily plan for business the one that every single employee does at the end of the day, planning their next day. So between, by the time someone leaves, they have written a plan for their next day, a to-do list, a list of what has to be achieved the next day. Once people are good at daily planning, then we get them under weekly planning. Once they're good at weekly planning, we get them under quarterly planning, and then their annual, and then the three to five year plan. Too many businesses only do the three to five year plan or the one year plan, and unfortunately, the way you get an annual set of results is by getting a daily set of results. So planning is number one part of execution. Number two part is the systems that you have in a company. And I, I teach it this way. People come to me and say, Brad, what is the key to great consistency in business? And that's part of execution. And the key to consistency is a systematic approach. And the most basic fundamental system is the checklist the checklist that is in place. So if someone says to me something along the lines of, oh, I don't get uh, the level of consistency in my employees, I look to them and I say, listen, the reason you're not getting consistency, well, in fact, I'll ask them a simple question. Can you show me the checklist that your employee has to follow? And when there is no checklist, there is no system. Therefore, there's no consistency. So the most basic job of any manager is making certain that there is a systematic methodology or a checklist in place for each task that needs to be done in the organization. The third part to execution is that of measurement. Measuring, the old management axiom, you cannot manage what you do not measure. And I'll get to management in a little while when I talk people, but management is a big part of execution. You see, management is different to leadership. And people are often, oh, you don't want to be a manager, you want to be a leader. Absolutely, you want management. 
Unless an employee is measured, they cannot be managed. Unless they are measured on a daily or hourly basis, uh, some jobs can be measured hourly. Most can be very easily measured daily. And some you have to measure weekly or monthly. But those daily routines, those daily activities that need to be measured, if you do these things every day very well, then at the end of the week, at the end of the month, you will have achieved your goals. What are the things that need to be done every day and measured every day? Some of them can be subjective. For instance, uh, our front desk receptionist. One of them is rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. How well did you smile before answering the phone or greeting a guest in our business today? And they just rate themselves. It's not that it's a measure, it's that it reminds them every day that that's one of the most important six measures in their life. And point four of execution is communication. You know, the lack of communication leads to a lack of execution. When there is high level communication, meetings are designed if a meeting is anything other than a communication session, then we're missing the point of the meeting. Meetings are designed to be communicative. The design method of the meeting is for people to communicate what is going on, who's doing what by when, part of the plan. Execution is a very big part. And when you learn that discipline, read the book, do whatever you need to do, work with an action coach. When you learn that discipline, you get there. Now, Part four is that of, sorry, part three is that of strategy. And we're going to spend an extra few minutes on strategy because I think a lot of businesses are going to have to pivot their strategy right now. I think a lot of businesses are going to have to change, especially in a virtual viral world. What we have to do changes and it shifts. Our management structure has to change. Our leadership strategies and communication have to change. Our marketing and sales has to change in an environment that we're going through. Sometimes so too does our core strategy. Now, when I use the term strategy, I don't mean by which you go to market. I mean the core business model, the model of the business, the very basic fundamental strategy behind the business. Now, a good strategy has four main parts to it. I'll explain each of them separately. Number one is leverage, two, scalability, three, opportunity, and four, marketability. Leverage, my definition of the word leverage is do the work once, get paid forever. I'll say that again, do the work once, get paid forever. Or you can add to that, or at least long term, okay? Or at least long term. I think that's an important uh, uh, factor that we need to be thinking of. So let's look at leverage in three different ways. Number one, let's look at it from uh, the work that you do. Owner's work, manager's work, must pay you back long term or forever. Employee's work is work where you do the work once and get paid once. For example, if you have a uh, hairdressing business, if you are cutting hair, you are working one time and being paid one time. That is not owner's work or manager's work, that is employee's work. Gradually an owner must move themselves to a position of doing owner's work, not just employee's work. Second way I wanna look at leverage, based on the product or service. The product or service needs to be something where you get a customer once and you keep them coming back long term or forever. If you have to keep getting new customers all the time, if you, if you get them once, they buy your product or service, there's nothing else for them to buy, they go off and do something else, then you need to look at the product or service and how you price it and how you structure it and that sort of thing. The third way I want to look at it is by giving you a simple example of how leverage can change a business's outlook. Let's use a business that most of us will be quite well aware of, and that is Apple. Apple computers, uh, way back when it first started, did not use a lot of leverage. This was a company that was a computer manufacturer. They made a computer, and if you're a manufacturer, you make it once, sell it once. There's no leverage in that. You made it once and sold it once. Apple, uh, well, at the other end of Silicon Valley, you had uh, Microsoft. Microsoft made a piece of software once and sold it a million, a billion times. They didn't have to remake it to resell it. They made it once and sold it a million times. Now, we look at what happened. Apple went on, Steve, uh, sorry, Bill Gates became the richest person in the world. Steve Jobs gets fired from Apple. Now, Steve Jobs went off and ran a company that he built up and sold to Disney called Pixar. He bought this little company. They made a lot of great movies. But what did he learn there? First, he learned management and leadership, which is a whole other story. But second of all, what he very much learned was leverage. You make a movie once and you sell it forever and a day. You make it once and sell it a million times. 
So when he sold uh, that to Disney for billions, now Disney, there's an example of amazing leverage. They invented a mouse once and they've sold it for now however many years and they sell it a bazillion different ways. It's phenomenal. Disney is a, a clear winner on, this, on the leverage scale of any business out there in the world. Phenomenal, phenomenal leverage. However, let's go back to Apple. Steve Jobs comes back to Apple. Apple is about to go bankrupt. So if you can read that story yourself. But here he comes back with a simple idea. We need to get leverage. So he moved them into the music business. He went out and he found a great system. So basically, uh, Sony had already created the MP3 player. Napster had already created a downloadable online platform where people could download music. He recreates both, turns it into the iPod and, and, uh, and iTunes and takes a business where even, uh, even smarter than me, you think about it, he didn't have to do the work once and get paid forever. Apple doesn't make any music. Apple doesn't make any TV shows or movies. They're starting to move into that now, obviously. But here you go as a company that does the work never and gets paid forever. They're getting 30 cents on the dollar for every song sold on their platform. Now, Apple, even smarter, went into the rental of music business. They take a monthly. Now they're in rental of TV shows. They take a monthly with Apple TV. There's so much genius in that story where we see that leverage takes a business from a position of about to go bankrupt to a position of the world's highest value company for quite a period of time there. Second, we look at scalability when we're developing a business model. So scalability, by my definition, is very simply put, the next sale costs less and is easier. The next sale costs less and it's easier. If your business gets harder as it gets bigger, there's a lack of scalability. If your business gets more costly as it gets bigger, there's a lack of scalability. So these two points here, leverage and scalability, are what we first look at when we look at the uh, business model, the core of any business that's out there. Now, a lot of businesses in this time frame are learning that their leverage and their scale are not there, especially in a virtual viral world. We've got to start changing that. So speak with your action coach and look at how you can do that. Number three is opportunity. That's the size of the market that you're going into. You know, too many business people go into a market where there just isn't enough revenue or isn't enough money in the total market opportunity size for them to gain the level of business that they want. Uh, that's why in today's world, we've got to be thinking more globally and we've got to be thinking about these opportunities where the biggest growth is. Now, it just happens that India is one of the best growth markets in the world and you are situated perfectly to take advantage of that. And, and that is one of the most phenomenal things that you have going for you right now. I think that uh, one of the greatest things about India is that you have massive opportunity. One of the biggest challenges, though, is that very few of the entrepreneurs are thinking on the global scale that the biggest entrepreneurs are. And I think there's too many great entrepreneurs in India that are thinking way too small right now. They're not thinking massive. They're not thinking to go great uh, on a global scale. And that, that, to me, is something that needs to be addressed. Point number four, marketability. Marketability by definition is that the market sells itself. The product or service sells itself. We're not having to convince everyone to buy it. All we're having to do is convince people to buy it from us. So for instance, uh, I look at my commercial cleaning business. Uh, that I bought that business down in Australia. It's now spreading into the UK. Then we'll bring it to here in the United States. And I sit down and I look at it and I go, I don't have to convince you you need cleaning. I don't have to convince you to get your office cleaned or your gymnasium or your retail store or whatever it is cleaned. All I have to convince you is to buy it from me. That is marketability. People have a budget for it. They already buy it. All I got to do is convince them to buy it from me. You put all those four things together and that's strategy behind a business. So then we move to business development being the fourth discipline of the, of the uh, five core disciplines that we're going to be examining here today. Business development is really your sales, your marketing, and your customer service. How does sales, marketing, and customer service come together? And in reality, if you are a non-growth business, it doesn't take much for your sales, marketing, and, and customer service to be... Uh, good enough to keep your customer base 
but not good enough for you to win and grow at a rate of 30 times. Not good enough to grow like a Subway sandwiches opening five brand new stores around the world every day, obviously prior to the pandemic, not now. But we sit down and we look at it they have a system for opening businesses that is as good as most people have a system for opening their store. You know, you've got to have a system for opening in a new country, a system for opening a new store or a new town, if you really want to be thinking about strategy at that level. So when we take business development, here's my definition of it. And this was also another one of my books called Buying Customers. I have 17 books. You can jump on Amazon, order all 17 of them right now. Uh, and, and get your reading going. The prospect of business development is that of buying lifetime customers. What do I mean by buying customers first and foremost? The process of getting a customer takes money. If you go out and you, and you run an advertisement, be it online, be it offline, wherever it is, you have to invest money. Now, if I take an ad and let's say, uh, I, like one of our businesses in Australia, we run our advertising and for every thousand dollars in advertising, we get 10 new customers. We know that. So for every hundred dollars out, we get a new customer. So in other words, it costs me $100 to buy a new customer in that particular business. See, you must view marketing as the process of buying customers. Now, the lifetime comes in because we don't want to just get a customer who buys from us once. We want to buy a customer who buys from us long term. Now, this process of buying lifetime customers means we have to know how much does it cost to buy a customer and how much are they worth to us over their lifetime? How much are they worth to us in their first transaction? Let me give you a quick story around that. Many years ago, I had a dog food business. For those of you wondering, uh, I've owned now over 60 uh, companies that have traded and uh, each of them has taught me different lessons on business. In my dog food business, I knew that it cost me 30, uh, I could spend up to $38 to buy a customer. Why $38? Well, my first sale to a brand new customer made me 108 Australian dollars. This was an Australian business back in the day when I lived in Australia. For $108, I got a cust every time I got a customer, they spent $108 with us. Of that, $38 was profit to our business. So here's a question for you. If I was getting $38 profit, how much money could I afford to spend to buy a customer? See, if I was spending, and in this case, advertising was about $22 to buy a customer. So for every $22 that went out in marketing and advertising, I got $38 back. So here's a question. If, if, I, if I said to you, give me $22 and I'll give you $38 back, how many times would you give me $22? That's right. You would give me as many lots of $22 as you could, if you're smart, obviously, you know, because if you can go out and spend a dollar and make two, that's the best investment in the world. I was investing $22 and getting back $38. That, my friends, is called buying customers. Now, how do we do that? Well, we follow a simple formula. This formula, by the way, I suggest you write it down. This is the most important formula you will ever learn in business. It's the formula called the five ways. Leads by conversion rate equals number of customers. Number of customers times number of transactions times average sale equals revenues. Revenues by margin equals profit. Leads, leads means prospects, potential customers, uh, people that called you, people that emailed you, potential buyers, okay, prospects. So let's pretend we have a nice little business. In our little business, we had 4,000 leads last year, okay? In our little business, let's pretend we had a conversion rate of one in four. So your conversion rate is if 10 people called and two people bought, you had a conversion rate of two out of 10 or 20%. In this particular case, let's pretend it's one in every four people. So that's 25%. So how many customers do you have? Yes, write these numbers down so you have a record of this stuff. That gives you a thousand customers. A thousand customers multiplied by a number of transactions. In this case, I'm going to give you an average of two. Now, number of transactions means how many times did that customer buy from you in the average year? Now, some will buy once and never, ever be seen again. Others might buy 10, 12 times. In this little business, I'm going to give you a pretend number of two transactions. Some, some bought once, some bought 10 times. The average customer bought twice a year. Okay. 
Then we're going to look at average sale. To make the math easy, I'm just going to say it's 100 in this particular case, okay? Again, some spent five, some spent 5,000, but on average, our customers spend 100. So what's our revenue? Our revenue in this particular example is 200,000. Nice little business. Uh, and here they are, 1,000 customers by two transactions by 100 uh, each time gives us 200,000. Again, to make the math easy, I'm just going to make margins 25%. So one quarter, that gives us 50,000 in take home profit. Now, if you come and work with us at Action Coach, you're gonna work on the five ways. See, most people come to us and ask for three things. Well, Brad, I need more customers, I need more sales, I need more revenue, sorry, and I need more profitability. Well, those three are in red. Why do you think I've got number of customers, revenues and, mar and profits all listed in red? You know, why are they the highlighted ones? And if you said it's the most important, you're exactly the opposite of correct. The reason is the five most important ones is leads, conversion rate, transactions, average sale and margins, because they create those others. You'll see these have the equal sign in front of them. They are the end result. We've got to work on the five things that lead to that end result. Now, at Action Coach, we have uh, approximately 300 strategies. We have about 80 strategies for lead generation, about 80 for conversion rate, transactions about 70, about 60 for average sale, and or just under 60 for margins. So what we have is a toolbox to help you boost the bottom line of your business. Now, I don't wanna try and pretend that we can double those numbers for everybody. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna go with the ridiculously low number. We're gonna say that all we can do over 12 months is 10% better in each area. So if you could get learn everything from your action coach, read all the books, work with the coach for a year, and you got 10% better number of leads, okay? Not, don't, you know, you can do much better than that, obviously, but just 10% better. If you got your conversion rate up by 10%, okay, 10% better, not 10% more, not 35, just 27 and a half. And you should be able to do that purely by measuring. If all you do is measure, you should be able to get that level of result difference. So I've already done the math for you. That gives you 1,210 customers. So then we look at your repeat business rate, the number of transactions. If all you do is send people a thank you note and say, we'd love to see you buy from us again, usually that increases the transaction rate by 10%. But if you've got a database and you communicate with them and you ask them back all of these different strategies that we have to do that. So we increase there by 10%, two to 2.2. Then we go your average sale and we look at all of the different strategies to boost average sale from sales and stru structure strategies to purely just measuring again, about 70 strategies for average sale to improve. So if we just get it 10% better, so what we've done there is increase revenues by 10%, haven't we? Haven't we? No, maybe? No, I tricked you. We've actually increased revenues to 292,820. That, my friends, is a 46% increase in the revenue. Any accountant on the line will tell you very simply, if you've had a 46% jump in revenues, you've had a decent increase in profitability. But even if you had to use some of the 60 strategies, and even if all we did was a 10% improvement in our profitability of the business, we still get to $80,525.50, which is a 61% improvement in the bottom line. Now, I know you can do better than 10% in each of the five areas. I know you can do that, but I'm just trying to give you an example with the most low level numbers possible. If you read all the books and did all the work and did everything you needed to do, this stuff becomes common sense easy for you in your business. So from business development of marketing, we go to the customer service. Uh, in my book called Instant Repeat Business, I go through the ladder of loyalty where we take someone from a suspect, a potential buyer, we turn them into a prospect by finding out who they are, by doing marketing, by getting them to call us or contact us or email us or come into the store. Or, well, they can't come in at the moment in many markets, but that's the case. From prospect, we want to get them to make a purchase. We turn them into a shopper, a first time buyer. They're not a customer yet. If they've only done a single transaction, they're not yet a customer. They have to do a second transaction to become a customer. Custom meaning accustomed. They do business with you and they know how to do business with you. You're building loyalty into that customer. From customer, we want to make them feel special. We want to make them feel like a member where they belong. They know how to do business with us. They feel like they belong. They feel like they're a part of our business and that they should be getting great service from us. And they, 
Then we turn them into an advocate. We ask them to give us referrals. And again, I wrote a whole book on that subject, instant referrals, chat with your coach, read the book, understand all this stuff, how to get referrals from every customer that buys from you. Uh, if I go back to my dog food business, that business was amazing. Our average customer gave us two referrals. And if you do the math quickly, you see the multiplication factor of that business is phenomenal. But finally, we turn them into a raving fan. We turn them into someone that is ready to uh, not just give us referrals, but they post on social media about us. They love us. By the way, if you haven't posted on social media that you're on this today, take a shot of your screen. Take a shot of your screen or yourself, a selfie of you in front of the screen. Post it up and tag that you're with Brad Sugars today, learning from the best business coach in the world. That's me, Brad Sugars, number one business coach in the world with the number one business coaching team at Action Coach. Moving on to the fifth discipline, that of your people. Um, your people are the most important part of your business, okay? Because the reality of any business is your people are either your greatest asset or your biggest challenge. Your people are either the people that grow your business or they're the people that hold it back. So how you build your people determines how they build your business for you. See, how you take care of your employees is how they take care of your customers. And therefore, and that's how well your customers take care of your business and therefore how well your business takes care of you. It's a cycle. You've got to take care and build your people. If you take care of your people, they build your customer base for you and your customers then build your business for you and your business builds you and your bank account for yourself. So when we look at the human side of the business, we have to understand this simple philosophy. There is a point of power. Below that point, there are three behaviors we see in companies. Blame, excuses, and denial. Above that point, we see ownership, accountability, and responsibility. You'll notice below the line says bed. You made your own bed, you got a lion. And above is an oar. You've got your own ship, okay? Your ownership, and you've got the oar to paddle it. What happens below this point is these three behaviors, blame, excuses, and denial, are either in place in a company because there is bad management or a lack of management. Denial is the person that thinks they're a rock star, but they're actually doing a bad job in the business. Excuses, the person that's always got a reason why. Oh, I ran out of time. Blame is the person that is always pointing the finger. If these three behaviors are happening in your organization, it's a lack of management or bad management. We'll get to that and how to do good management in a moment. Above the point, these three behaviors are leadership. Management will get them to responsibility. Leadership will make them accountable and make them take ownership of the company. So we've got to learn both management and leadership. So management starts with those daily lists that I mentioned, getting every employee in the company to make a list every day of what they need to achieve the next day. It will improve productivity by approximately 30%. If every day before they leave, not in the morning when they come in, but every day before they leave, make a list of everything they need to achieve the following day, okay? Second thing that management entails is a weekly list, okay? Now, the weekly list is done on a Friday. So Fridays, you have to do two lists, one for Monday and one for the week. That weekly list turns into a meeting on Monday morning called the weekly whip meeting, work in progress. It is a communication session. So imagine I had a team of say six or seven people that reported directly to me. On Monday morning, we would all sit down and all go through each other's list. What are you doing? And what is that? How does that impact Bob? How does that impact Mary? What's this? What's that? What are you doing with this? Everyone goes through their list of what they're doing for the week. It is a communication session to make sure nothing slips through the cracks. Remember, great management leads to great execution. I wanna give you two words about management. If I can define management, management is about building competent, productive people. Competent, productive people. If there is a lack of competency, that means there's a lack of management. If there's a lack of productivity, it means there is a lack of management. You see, I see it with people, and, and I've heard this many times, somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000s, management became a bad word. If we go back to the 80s, the, the one minute manager was the best selling books on the planet, 80s and 90s. Why? Because we valued management. We didn't desecrate it. Management and leadership go hand in hand. Management, competent, productive people. Does that mean you need to micromanage? Yes, in the beginning, you do need to micromanage new people. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. They don't have productivity and competency. It's like raising a child almost. 
in the beginning, you have to do everything with them or for them and gradually you build them so they're competent and they don't need much management. If you build them into competent, productive people, they need less and less management as you go along, okay? But until you build them into that, they need lots of management. So that Monday morning meeting, we do the whip meeting, we go through everyone's list of what everyone's got on. Now in the beginning, that'll take a little bit of time, an hour to two hours sometimes, you know? Uh, my weekly whip meetings usually take about 45 minutes to an hour now because we've done it so much, everyone knows what's going on, everyone knows what's doing, and we're high communicators in our organizations. Number three, on a Thursday, we run a one-to-one -one session. This is called a lion meeting. Lion spelled L-I-O-N. You'll understand that why, so write it down. L stands for last week. We go through this week's list. What have they done from this week's list? What needs to still be achieved? What are their numbers for this week? Let's go over their measures. What are their daily goals and how are they doing with those daily uh, goals that they have to achieve? And we go through any, uh, any uh, activities that have come up from that. I stands for issues. So last week, issues. Uh, so any issues that came up during the week, we deal with them in their lion meeting. Then O stands for opportunities. What opportunities have you brought to the table this week to help the company grow? N stands for next week. What's on the table for you next week based on this? This is how you manage great companies. What you have to do to do this well, though, is get away from the my door is always open. You have to get away from that and lead P and manage people twice a week when people come to you and if you've trained them to keep coming to you um if i can be blunt most managers suffer from superhero itis they want to be the superstar and for that reason they end up uh answering every question people come to them with someone comes to you with a question you give them an answer what did they just learn nothing and or actually they did learn something if i need an answer i need to come to you and ask you for it Point four, we give everyone a personal plan. What's the plan for management? We learn their behavioral styles, all that stuff. Read the book, chat with one of the coaches. And the other part of management is walking around times two. Twice a day, 15 minutes, you gotta walk around your office, your business, your job sites, whatever it is, and go and take a look at what's going on on the ground floor. If you are sitting in your ivory tower, you're missing everything and vice versa. If all you do is walk around all day, you're annoying everybody else and you're not doing your work of managing and running the business and leading the business. Leadership on the other hand is about two different things. And this is where we're gonna to get to vision for today. Leadership in my opinion is about two things, focus. So passionate focused people, passionate, and focused are you giving them a focus now in this economic climate the number one thing a leader has to do is communicate 10 times more than they did before communicate daily with all of your people communicate weekly with your customer base keep communicating more and more and more in a negative economy leaders need to be seen if a leader is not seen they're not leading in a in a this because People get panicked when there's negative economies. People get worried when there's a downturn. People are panicked and worried and you need to give them the reassurance. You need to be that leader. We'll get to more on vision and focus in just a moment. If you are sh showing and displaying the signs of passion, then other people will be there with you. The leader needs to be the most passionate, most, you know, I, I speak with business people and they say, oh, I really don't like my business anymore. Well, good, get out of it. Because if you're not the most passionate person about your business, how do you expect your staff? If you don't love going to work, how do you expect your people to love coming to work? You know, you've got to be that passionate person. Now, let's finish off leadership and then we'll come back to vision. The second part of leadership is culture. The leader has to be the guardian of the culture. If uh, you want to learn a little bit about culture, jump on our website, actioncoach.com, and read about our 14 points of culture. Understand what we mean by it. Culture is like the behavioral rules of the company. The culture is what do we stand for? See, vision is where are we going? Culture is about who are we, okay? Who are we? And then we get to your mission, and that's about why you do what you do. Leadership is also communication. I mentioned that earlier, but I cannot stress enough that right now as a leader, I'm communicating five, 10 times more than I used to. If you don't follow me on social media, make sure you do that. I'm on LinkedIn, if LinkedIn's your favorite. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. Uh, my blog is at bradsugars.com. Uh, you can also follow me on, uh, on the YouTube. All my videos go on YouTube each day. So follow me on any of those. And if you love what I do, give me a great rating, give me a shout out. That'd be fantastic. Um, 
And the fourth point of leadership is every day, twice a day, make sure people hear from you about positive things. You've got to congratulate two people a day. Um, and the reason I say that is if people hear from you more when they do something wrong than when they do something right, you are not leading, okay? Leaders are the ones that give people a pat on the back, give them the kudos and make sure that they understand that you're enjoying what they're doing. Make sure you lead in this manner. Now, if, if, if we go back to vision, I want to spend five minutes here on vision, uh, and, and then hopefully I'll get to some questions. So, uh, team at Action Coach, can you please read through any questions and have the main, the most important questions lined up for me uh, so that when we get to it, we have five or ten minutes of doing questions, you've got the best questions lined up for me. Let's examine vision right now in this marketplace. First and foremost, the vision doesn't need to be massive and grandiose right now. Now, ultimately for a company, you want a vision that is a hundred year goal. You want a vision that is a guiding principle to the company. For us at Action Coach, if again, you jump on, in fact, on my YouTube channel or on the Action Coach YouTube channel, you'll find that I have a 20 minute video there about the vision of our company, a 20 minute video about the history of our company, a 20 minute video on the culture of our company, because every new person that joins our company, I want them to hear the vision direct from me. I want them to experience the, the company direct from me uh, and learn our history and our vision and our culture direct from me. Now that hundred year guiding light is the big principle vision that you're looking for. If you do not have one yet, and I, I wanna remind you of why a vision is of most importance. It's hard to motivate people, but it's easy to find people who are motivated by what you are aiming to achieve in the world. Our vision at Action Coach is world abundance through business re-education. World abundance through business re-education, which I might play you a video in just a moment to share with you a bit more about that and what having vision looks like in this day and age. When you understand that vision is, is more than what people, it has to be a common goal. It has to enroll and inspire people. It has to get them to want to join your team. It has to get them to feel like, yes, that's something I want to be a part of. If you can get vision to that scale, then you've got it. Now, if you don't have a grandiose vision yet, here is the vision. Use this exact language to be the very, yes, write it down, to be the very best, insert your industry. If you're a landscape company, to be the very best landscaper in, and then insert the market that you want to be in the whole of India or in Pune or in whatever it is, put, your, put it to be the very best landscaper in India. If you don't have a better one than that, start with that. Put your two things in your industry and your marketplace in there. Start there. Because see, the best people in the world want to work for the best company. I remember being 20 or 21 years old and complaining to my dad, who was a great businessman, and saying, Dad, you know what? I just can't get good people. He looked me square in the eye and he said, Brad, you get the people you deserve in business. You get the people you deserve. I was like, geez, Dad, thanks for that. I really appreciate you... Uh, uh, you know, but he was right. He really was right. And that's the way it is. Now, in today's world, we need to give people not just a vision, but we need to give them something to focus on weekly and monthly, short term. You need to give your people short term goals, short term focus, short term things to achieve. Because if we give them that short term stuff, we can get them passionate and focused. If we can give them the short term, we get them excited about what's going on today. So they're getting little wins, small wins, excitable things. When the market is shifting and changing dramatically, we need to move fast and we need to give our team small wins, small goals, small stuff to achieve. And that, my friends, is where we need to be focusing in right now. That ultimate vision of the company needs to be that guiding light, that North Star, as the, as the old saying goes. But ultimately, that 100-year goal is something that we can achieve. As I mentioned, for us at Action Coach, it's world abundance through business re-education. For us, it's about changing the world by educating business people, hence doing this event for you, hence all of the other aspects. 
You see, when it comes down to the five core areas of adding zeros, you'll start to see that everything starts to fall in place. Yes, take a screen grab of that if you want to, or take a photo of it with your phone. It's in the book, it's everywhere out there online. But the five stakeholders, the customers, the team, the owners of the company, the community, and the corporation, the entity itself, all of them have to win if we're gonna be adding zeros. And they all win when these five areas, these five disciplines, work in, con in conjunction with each other. You know, this book is something that I wanna teach everyone. Before I get to questions though, I just wanna actually play a video if I can, gang. I'm gonna play a short video for you. Let me pull this up. Let me just, oh, hang on, I gotta go back to window sharing. There you go, hang on one sec, gang. Optimize. Thanks for bearing with me while I go back to this one. This is what I believe leadership looks like in this day and age. World abundance through business re-education. Since 1993, Action Coach business coaches have lived that vision by helping business owners across the planet build great companies, create more jobs, and truly grow their communities. Real people getting real results. We've always believed that being in business should give you more life, and right now we believe in something even greater. The abundance of those amazing business owners. The abundance of the employees in those companies. The abundance of providing free education to every business owner and every local or national business group globally. The abundance of being there for you and every business that needs us right now. team let's go to questions what do we got let me get my camera back on what do we got in the way of questions coming in Does someone want to read them for me or do i need to uh, hi brad this is tabushu hey tabushu thank you for reading the questions for me good to uh, chat to you again today yes so happy brad that you're, you're now doing a session for india we're so so blessed so uh, I'm super thrilled and excited, and I'm just going to quickly go through some of the questions. Um, I think that there's a whole lot, uh, uh, the, the whole scare around the COVID-19, uh, mm -hmm. and the multiple questions coming around the same thing as to, you know, what are your, people want to know, what are your thoughts about how the post-COVID-19 world would look like, and what are the specific trends uh, that you would like to highlight? That is a fantastic question. Um, so my first thing is, I believe that what we have to do is, is get ourselves to a plan for making certain, uh, and I'm just putting some links in the uh, panelists box in the uh, chat for every, uh, I'll make these links go to everybody. Um, now, I wanna make sure that people understand. I've taught all of my people that you gotta get a 90 day plan to get through this thing. So 90 days, to get through it. Um, I'll see if I can find the links as well on uh, YouTube for my uh, other videos of exactly what to do with COVID-19. Um, now, when I say that 90 day plan to get through, it's one of those simple things that we sit here and we say, okay, how are we gonna get through this stuff? How are we actually gonna get through it? Now, the post uh, COVID world will not go back to the same way it was before. It's just not going to. People are going to have different ways of, of uh, looking at this. People are gonna have different ways of um, being in the marketplace. And what we're gonna have to see is that there is so much for us to learn and so much for us to understand um, that it's, it's going to be different. Now, the same way that 2008 changed the way people bought housing, changed the way people, people stopped wanting to buy housing and there were more renters going into it. What I see with this is people are going to want to work more virtually. People are going to want to have more of their own businesses. There's going to be more and more of this stuff coming uh, into the marketplace for all of us. Um, and, and that's a very big part of it. Now, what we need to be planning is first of all, how to survive it. And then what we need to start planning is how do we actually get through this thing? Now, I did put together a full 10 day, 30 minutes a day training on this. So what I am gonna do is right now, I'm gonna put the link for that 
in there for everybody, okay? Um, there's the link for that full 10 day training. It's free, jump in there. It's, uh, everyone can have it for free. Share it with every business owner you know. Um, also, I'm doing a marketing webinar again in a week's time um, that if you register for it, here is the link to the marketing webinar. Um, and I'm doing all of this stuff for free and my action coach team can teach you all of these things, okay? So get with the action coach team. What I really see coming out of COVID is the, the number one thing I see coming out of this is those who see this as an opportunity will do massively well. Those who learn how to pivot and go virtual and viral will do massively well out of this thing. One last thing before I get to the next question, I'm going to throw a link up here. Uh, we have a training program that's a thousand dollar training program. It's called 30X. Uh, we're now doing that for $99 just for people to get through this whole thing. So there's a free 10 day one there. There's a free webinar. There's a $99 uh, program there for those of you that want to do that. Do any of them, do them all, do whatever you need to do, but that's, that's there for you. Tabisha, what's the next question? Is there more on COVID? Uh no, that the COVID situation is leading uh, us to, you know, get to the next big challenge, which is handling people mm -hmm. and people is a big thing. So strategy, technology, yet we can, you know, you can deal with it, but it's the people, which is the, by far the most complex. And the first mm -hmm. impediment is salary cuts. Mm -hmm. So that's the first uh, issue. People uh, are wondering, how do we actually overcome this issue where you still keep people connected uh, with us? But, you know, you can't keep them motivated if you're telling them I'm not going to be paying you a lot. Yeah. What's yeah. your view on that? The, the reality is what you have to do is pull everybody together. I know when this first happened, I sat my entire team down and I said to them, listen, we're going to get through this. I don't know how we're going to get through it, but we're going to get through it. We may have to. I don't want to do any layoffs. I really don't want to do that. If I can get away with it, I'm not going to do that. What we may need to do is all of us take a pay cut for a period of time to get through this. We may need to do that. But I want to be open and upfront with you. If that's what we need to do, then that's what we're going to need to do. You have to communicate as a group. You have to communicate openly and as bluntly and as honestly as you can with your team right now. If you are not communicating bluntly, it's very difficult for them to actually believe you and follow you. You need to have your team saying things to you like, well, thank you for having our back, boss. Thank you for everything you're doing for us. You need to communicate and show your team what you're doing. If you're doing 12-hour days just to keep the lights on, then you need to share with your team, gang. You know, it was amazing. I was up till, like, you know, right now for me, it's 10 p.m. at night. I've been going since 6 a.m. this morning teaching. And I'll make sure my team knows that I was up till 10 p.m. at night doing this stuff because I want them to understand just how hard I'm working to make sure they keep their job. Brilliant. Totally uh, get the point, Brad. I think it's such a uh, deep reflection that needs to be done by each and every business owner and they need to go out and ensure that the team completely understands by maintaining the transparency and honesty up front. Uh, another question that's come up uh, and I thought that's really interesting is uh, as, as you know, you made a point, you said about, talked about management and leadership and you said mm -hmm. you need to, you know, not sit in your ivory towers, get down there, get, get to people, manage them on a day-to-day -day basis. The question mm -hmm. is, uh, there is so much to do now in this uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, situation that we are in. Um, I'm really struggling to get uh, to this position where uh, I know we're working all virtually. How do I get my hands on to, uh, you know, actually working with the team one-on-one -on -one, uh, if they're all spread out together? Yeah. Look, what you've got to do is follow that management structure that I talked about. We also have daily huddles. So every team has a daily huddle first thing in the morning. Every team has a daily huddle at the end of the day. And the entire organization has a daily huddle in the middle of the day. You've got to increase your communication levels. You've got to massively boost your communication levels to make certain that the people that you're working with are all feeling together. Mental health during this is massive. If, you're, if you've got to keep your people focused, you've got to keep them excited, you've got to keep them hearing of wins. Every day in our group huddle, the only topic in our entire organization group huddle is what are the wins today? Who's got some good news for us? What is your good news? Make sure everyone feels that way. Now, your one-to-one -one work, you're going to have to up the uh, amount of communication. 
My CEOs of all my companies, I used to talk with them once a month. Now I have them every single week. I'm working harder at communication than I've ever done for a long period of time because of the whole virtualness and the change in the market. The market shifts every week. If you go back and watch those two YouTubes, you'll see the one I did four weeks ago versus the one I did two weeks ago, my message shifted in that two weeks. My message today is shifting again. My message on Friday when I do the marketing will shift again. My message in two weeks, that's why I'm saying to people, follow me on social media because I my message shifts daily and weekly because of the way the market is shifting. I yeah. guess that's our time. Uh, that's about it. Yep, I yeah. agree with you, Brand. That's about it. The, uh, most questions are almost on the similar line, so I'm going to skip them. Listen, I will, uh, if anyone has any other things, I'm doing plenty more stuff, but talk to your action coach. All of my coaches are giving away one free hour to any business owner that needs it. Chat with them, learn with them, learn from them. They are amazing business people and they're here to help you. You know, I, I'll finish with one simple message and that is this. As a business person right now, do whatever it takes to keep the lights on. Keep selling, keep marketing. Don't let anyone tell you that, oh, you know, you shouldn't be marketing right now, or you shouldn't be selling right now. No, keep selling, keep marketing, keep the lights on, keep your business growing and pivot, change, do what you need to do to stay ahead of the marketplace. Those who don't change are gonna die off in this thing. Those who just say, well, I'll just ride this out. No, you need to come out of this stronger. See this as a massive opportunity to become stronger and be doing better. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on here today. I look forward to uh, the rest of the conversation as everyone goes through. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you so much for joining us.